Every four years, the USA votes and the world watches. And this time they got a real eyeful between the vote controversy and the violent aftermath. How does that stuff look to our friends and foes around the world? And how will President Biden be perceived and received by other world leaders? Let's ask John Sidalides, Trilogy Advisors in Washington. John is a geopolitical strategist. He is a consultant to the Department of State. John, welcome back to The Big Picture. Great to be with you, Holland. Thanks for having me. The ultimate insider succeeds the ultimate outsider, Donald Trump, whose first secretary of state uh, seemed out of his depth and whose eventual secretary of state came off kind of gruff. Uh, Joe Biden and his more diplomatic secretary of state already know many world leaders. Does this give the president an immediate advantage? To a certain degree, Holland, I think it really depends on a case-by-case -case basis which leaders and which countries we're talking about. Uh, for instance, General Secretary Xi is probably still wondering what kind of a relationship he'll have with President Biden and the Biden administration. As you correctly note, there will be a smoother, more nuanced diplomatic tone to U.S. foreign policy. And Joe Biden was clear about that during the presidential campaign. But it seems at least uh, the, le the first several weeks of this administration, they're largely sticking to the Trump strategy of how to deal with China, a very tough on Hong Kong, on Taiwan, on making sure that we provide arms to Taiwan, coming down hard on Xinjiang and uh, continuing the Trump policy of calling China's policies against the Uyghur Muslims genocide. And so I think uh, they're looking to see where there are going to be some differences, maybe in terms of trade talks and the like. But she, I think, is going to be puzzled by the Biden administration for some time to come. What will be what Moscow's perspective will be. On the one hand, you have the uh, extension of the New START nuclear treaty between the United States and Russia, but you also have the ban on fracking on federal lands, which will make the U.S. Uh, a less powerful exporter of oil and natural gas, which means that the prices of those natural resources will drive up, and that will help the Russian economy. But there may also be sanctions on the Russian-German pipeline Nord Stream 2 that will cause a tremendous row between both the U.S. and Germany and the U.S. and Russia. So that's going to be a very fluid relationship, I believe, in the months to come. And I would just round out right now, Holland, on Iran, which I think was looking forward to a restoration of the JCPOA under a Biden administration. But it seems to date the White House is declaring that Iran must meet the terms of the 2015 agreement and go backwards from where Iran has uh, traveled over the last five years in terms of uranium enrichment and a whole number of other violations of that agreement before talks can resume on whether or not the U.S. will rejoin the, the nuclear agreement. But the Iranians have also got to be happy that the Biden administration has declared that the Houthi rebels in Yemen are not a terrorist organization which is a bit of a slap against our traditional Saudi allies in the region. So again, uh, a very nuanced foreign policy under this new administration in three of our most troubled regions in the world. John, take us inside what Washington insiders call foggy bottom, the Department of State, as uh, Anthony Blinken takes over and President Biden is appointing new U.S. ambassadors around the world. How is the vibe inside state these days? I think it's a very positive one. Uh, remember that Antony Blinken is a veteran of the State Department. He pretty much launched his foreign relations career in the State Department in the early 1990s before moving over to work in the Clinton White House and the National Security Council. He's an eight-year veteran of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee when now President Biden was either chairman or ranking member. And then he worked in the Obama National Security Council for eight years before going into the private sector. So he's a, a steady, uh, well-known hand of the State Department, of the Democratic Party foreign policy establishment, and coupled with a number of veteran Democratic hands of the State Department who worked both in the Obama administration and as far back as the Clinton administration, my own sense is that many of the every people at State have a sense that there is a, a steadier uh, helm, a steadier hand at the helm in the State Department. It'll be less disruptive than it was under the Trump administration. But of course, President Trump uh, was very clear that he intended to be a disruptive force, whereas Joe Biden is looking to be more of a, a calming salve 
so to speak, in the State Department. And we'll see that play out both in terms of the relationship between the White House and the State Department with the Senate and the House of Representatives on foreign policy, and certainly through our embassies and international organization memberships around the world. We are speaking with geopolitical strategist uh, John Sidalides. John, you mentioned uh, China and Russia always on the front burner. You touched on Iran, uh, which is always problematic. What next for uh, North Korea after uh, the uh, Trump-Kim photo op relationship? And uh, what are a couple, uh, if there are a couple, other hot spots we should be watching? I got about two minutes. Well, North Korea is always a hot spot because of the mercurial nature of the young leader, uh, Kim Jong-il, and also Kim Jong-un, and also the fact that there are nuclear weapons that are both increasing in quantity, but also if there's a potential regime change or a regime collapse in North Korea, we don't know how to ensure that those nuclear weapons don't fall into the hands of very dangerous adversaries or non-state actors around the world. But other hot spots, Holland, I think that Taiwan is going to be a very, very important issue for the United States because General Secretary Xi is making very clear he is looking to see how best to unify Taiwan with China, perhaps under his presidency. We saw how he operated in Hong Kong, violated the agreement with the United Kingdom with impunity, and is now looking perhaps to make sure that there is no significant independence movement there. I think Iran and Saudi Arabia is always going to be a hot spot. Those are the two countries that are looking to dominate the Muslim uh, Arab, uh, not the Arab world, uh, the Muslim world in the Middle East. The Iranians, of course, are not Arabs. And I think also what's going to be happening between Russia and the European Union is going to be very critical. We see just in, in recent days has been a very uh, difficult relationship that has become more, much more troublesome in the last several days. And I think the, whether or not the European Union decides to slap sanctions on Russia because of the Navalny case at the summit in March is going to direct that relationship going forward. So Taiwan, Middle East, Russia, EU, North Korea, these have been the troubled spots and they likely will be for the months to come. Yeah, well, we're short on time, but I'm going to ask you anyway, I must. Uh, President Trump ruffled a lot of feathers among our allies. Are we better off now? Are the Brits and the Europeans heaving a sigh of relief that Uncle Joe is in the White House now? It depends on which European countries we're looking at. Uh, I believe the Germans are probably much more relieved because they were very clear in that they did not find President Trump to be a good partner. But uh, certainly Prime Minister Boris Johnson found his uh, philosophical kin in Donald Trump. A number of other countries such as Poland, Spain, Eastern Europe, they had good relations with the Trump administration. Germany, Macron, that's a question mark. In some areas, I think he thought he had a, a strong relationship with Trump. In other areas, he's been promoting now strategic aut autonomy for NATO and for the European Union. But the Germans are certainly yep. the happiest people in uh, Europe now that Biden has replaced President Trump. Yeah, who got off on the wrong foot with Merkel uh, as soon as he became president. John Sidalides, Trilogy Advisors, thanks again for your time.